All right, welcome back to the F14 Tomcast episode four. And today we're gonna to be talking with Sam Slammer Richardson about actually flying the F14. Crunch, something that viewers can look forward to is when Slammer talks about learning the trick and how to become a good F-14 pilot. You're right, Bio, and one of the best quotes he had in there was that it's an easy airplane to fly, but a hard airplane to fly well. So stay tuned, buckle up, here we go. Hi, I'm Craig Snyder, call sign Crunch, and as you may know, I am an, uh, a former F-14 pilot, former Top Gun instructor, and I have about 2,500 flight hours, as well as about 650 traps. And I'm Dave Baronic, call sign Bio. I was an F-14 Rio. I also have about 2,500 flight hours and about 650 traps. Welcome back to the F-14 Tomcast. Now, we dedicate one episode to the Tomcats AUG-9 and AIM-54, and for that episode, our guest was a Rio. So today, we'll be talking to a former F-14 pilot about another feature of the Tomcat that set it apart from the fighters that preceded it, its impressive maneuverability. Grumman incorporated lessons from Vietnam combat into the design of the F-14, including the requirement for robust maneuverability, outstanding visibility in the cockpit, and more. To explore those features, we're talking with former Tomcat pilot, retired Captain Sam Slammer Richardson, who is well known in the community for his piloting skills. Welcome, Slammer. Thank you, Bio Crunch. Uh, great to be here. Thank you. Hey, it's good to see you again after uh, being at Miramar together uh, so many years ago. So, Slammer, to get us started, uh, tell us where you're from and how did you get into Tomcats? Well, originally I'm from San Diego but uh, was a son of a, a naval pilot. And we traveled all over the world, east coast, west coast, um, uh, out to Italy, out to uh, Hawaii. And then when my dad retired, uh, moved up to Julian, California. And so I'm basically a local San Diego uh, uh, product, but with a father who was a naval aviator, uh, always had my eyes set on naval aviation. All right. Well, hey, uh, so, you know, Slammer, you and I, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, but for a lot of our listeners, they, they might not know all that much about you. Uh, can, tell us a little bit about your F-14 experience. You know, what, the span, the arc of your career, beginning to end, what'd you do? Okay. Um, well, went to UCLA on an ROTC scholarship with the idea of going to uh, flight training. Um, had a uh, electrical engineering degree coming out of UCLA and moved down to um, Pensacola to start my naval aviation career. But I always had the, the, the objective of getting back to Miramar and flying the Tomcat. It was, uh, it was a dream aircraft uh, as, a, as a kid growing up and I just wanted to be able to fly that. Plus my dad was a, a fighter pilot during World War II. Um, had a number of kills uh, in that conflict. And so I was always, always wanted to be a fighter pilot. And the Tomcat represented everything I wanted uh, in that aircraft. Uh, now to do that, the, the way naval aviation training works is every stage, they give you just enough time to be barely proficient. And so whether it be in academics or primary, um, they would, they would basically give you just enough time to learn how to you know, safely take off or land the airplane, uh, handle emergency procedures, fly instrument, instruments, fly acrobatics. And what it did was it, it basically spread out the people who could learn quicker, I think, than the others. And those who could learn quicker and react faster tended to you know, kind of pop out toward the top of the class. And as you worked your way through, it was the top of the class that tended to get their, uh, their desires. And the ones who could, could think far enough ahead of the airplane seemed to go into the jet community. And once again, you go into uh, jets. And for me, I stayed in Pensacola in VT-4, which at that time was a strike, uh, intermediate and advanced strike uh, pilot training squadron. 
And at each phase, you would now, now with all the jet guys, you would once again start in the T2, and you'd learn basic uh, formation, basic instruments, basic handling, and then carrier qualifications, um, and a little bit of other uh, basic uh, tactics that, that uh, um, you were introduced to. And once again, you would be ranked again about how quickly you could pick up these things and then you would be kind of stratified and those toward the top of the class would get their their selection and those that didn't do as well may not get their selection and so for me I went through T2s in Pensacola uh, performed very well there jumped into the A4 uh, did uh, well there as uh, two but at the time that I finished was was April of 85 uh, there were no Tomcat slots and um, and so the uh, my squadron CO rolled me back as a surgrad instructor. Oh, and nice! So to be a surgrad instructor, you had to be in the top third of the class. And so I got another bonus, 18 months, which killed me because all I wanted to do was get to the fleet and uh, get into the Tomcat. Uh, but that wasn't a, an option when I went through after until after I finished my uh, instructor time. And then yeah. I, this I, I got a- to go. This is really a great explanation of the training command. I'm serious. So, yeah. so this is good, but keep yeah, going. Yeah. Yep. Um, so anyway, I finished, uh, finished up there the, uh, I guess, probably December of 86 and uh, made my way back out to, to Pens- or back out to California to Miramar. Uh, and it was just, it was just the, the, the happiest day of my life to be making that trek back west. Uh, and go to the uh, famed VF-124, the gunfighters, uh, and start off flying fighters out of Miramar in San Diego. Uh, there wasn't anything better in life. Uh, it was. It truly was a, a remarkable existence back at the time. The class that I, uh, I joined up with, there were five, uh, as I remember, there were five pilots uh, and five Rios in our class. It was... I think we started in January of 87 and the five uh, pilots, we were all surgrads. And so as a, the, the advantage you had as a surgrad is you came in with an extra 800 hours of, uh, of experience. And so if people made it through uh, uh, training command right into the fleet, they would show up with maybe 250 hours, maybe 200, somewhere in that range. For us, we would show up with uh, close to a thousand hours. And so the, the difference in any sort of airplane between 200 hours and 1,000 is an awful lot of situational awareness. And you just come at the, at the training with a little more mature sense of, of understanding of aerodynamics and um, all things related to, you know, seat in the, uh, you know, stick and throttle and, and um, uh, basic handling and flying skills. So we, we ended up showing up there with a little bit of a head start over uh, over other folks, but it was funny because all five of us had all come from that uh, surgrad community. So I think we had a, a pretty strong class as it was going through. I bet you did. That's, That's that the, the, every surgrad that I've ever you know come to, come to my squad, they always have they're always a little bit better than everybody else. Well, you have that air sense, and you only get that air sense be, you know after. Um, spending time in the airplane and seeing different situations that you may not have seen before. Uh, and for us, you know, we were junior uh, aviators as instructors with even more junior students trying to kill you on a regular basis. And so you, you got introduced to an awful lot and you, you, you uh, were always spring loaded to something going wrong in, in a number of cases um, that happened. So you do show up with, with that type of um, uh, just awareness, situational awareness, I guess I'd say. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So now you, you so you went to the fleet. What was your first fleet squadron? I, I don't remember. It was VF-114, the Fighting Aardvarks. Ooh, you had were, the orange flight suit. They were renowned in, uh, in uh, Miramar as being the most obnoxious squadron because they had those orange flight suits. And if you're you in know, an I orange was just gonna say suit, that, so. you, you have to stay as a pack. Because you stand out, and uh, and it's kind of funny, because as as you go through the the rag, uh, and for me going through the rag, it was about a, oh, I guess I started in 
in the January, February time frame and finished up in around uh, December. So you've got about nine months of, uh, of training. So you, you were introduced to the, all the different uh, squadrons at Miramar, and, and when it finally came time for me to make my selection, when I'd finished and carrier called, I went up to the OPSO, who was Cookie Cook at the time, and he says, Slammer, where do you want to go? I go, I go, Cookie, I want to go to any squadron but that squadron wearing orange, the Aardvarks. And he said, congratulations, you're going to the Aardvarks. <laughs> uh, oh my God! Oh, sounds like the Navy. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> they were they were uh, deploying in just a few weeks, and so uh, they needed somebody who had uh, who had performed well at the boat and who had could basically go on deployment right away. Uh, and it was the greatest thing ever. It was the most fabulous squadron. Um, there were two, maybe three squadrons at Miramar that stood out. VF two was one. Typically stood out. VF one was another. The Yardvarks were always right up in there uh, for winning battle efficiency, one in the mother. I mean, everything. It was, it was a fantastic squadron. That's awesome. Now that brings up a good point. So you talk about the squadrons that are standing out. They're probably they're not standing out because, you know, of the the fancy flight suits. They're standing out because of the people, the the pilots, yeah. and, and the way they carry themselves, how good they are in the airplane. You don't win the battle e as the battle efficiency award that you referred to by being a bunch of slack. But by not being good. So, you yeah. know, you probably had a whole bunch of great, you know, mentors or people to guide you while you were there. You know, were those the department's heads, other lieutenants that are there just a couple of years older to you? Who were they and uh, what they teach you? Well, we were so I, I think I would I would say that the uh, the squadrons that were strong and perennially strong always had a strong front office. You had a strong skipper and and focused on the right things. They were focused on, on tactical employment. They were focused on being the best. They weren't caught up in the minutia. And for some reason, you would see some squadrons that, that you know, weren't really focused in the way that, that, that I would always be, you know, expect a squadron to be focused on. And so we had a very strong uh, skipper. Uh, uh, the department heads may not have been the strongest, but they were, there were a couple that were standout. Um, but the lieutenants, we had some great lieutenants. And uh, in a fighter squad, and you got a g bunch of good, uh, you know, the junior officer, the JOPA. If you've got a strong JOPA, you've got a, uh, you got a solid squadron. And we certainly had that with the, uh, with the Aardvarks. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the key people that we had, so, so two dogs trainer, or excuse me, um, uh, tra uh, Cobra trainer was a Rio, and he was our skipper. And he was a Vietnam era guy, knife in the teeth. Uh, you will fly the airplane. You will beat the other guy. I mean, really, uh, you know, set a great example. Uh, Don Bringle uh, was one of the department heads. Uh, he was my uh, flight lead. And um, well, that's good. Yep. And so, uh, and that'll play a little bit later in my life, uh, uh, later on post Top Gun, but. Uh, but he was my flight lead and a, an outstanding human. Uh, but the, the lieutenants, you had uh, probably four or five really, really strong lieutenants that uh, unfortunately, none of them stayed in the Navy. They all went out uh, into the airlines, but uh, really were very, very good uh, examples and very good sticks. So it was, a, it was a good group all the way around. Okay, so I'm dying to ask this, Slammer, and, I, and, and you know, we're being candid here, uh, so so, you, and this is something that I didn't really think about back in the day. But you're a junior officer. You got KD as your uh, section lead. What kind of stuff? Uh, and again, one before I say the words, you'll go bio. You never were a rag instructor, were you? But I'm going. What kind of stuff was KD or the other guys teaching you to make you a good pilot? Were they saying slammer, go up and, and try a rudder reversal or do what you, whatever you, you know, give us, tell us, tell the audience some stuff, uh, how a young guy becomes a good Tomcat pilot. Yeah. Well, then I'd have to go back and go back to the rag. The, uh, okay. And actually even before that, when, uh, when, when I went through flight training, the, um, when I got into A4s, which is the very first time you really start flying air combat maneuvering, um, there was just a, a sense that, that, that you got as to, I remember this one time that, that um, um, 
I don't remember, it was a 1v1, and I found myself really overshooting the instructor. And for some reason, I just thought, this isn't going to work out, and I did a freaking a lag roll over the back of him that had not been taught before, but it seemed to make sense, and I maintained that, that offensive position. Uh, coming into the rag, I had a guy. That's good. I had a guy like Pogo Clark, who was one of the yeah. one of the very very famous Tomcat pilots, and God God rest his soul, um, just a fabulous human, was a Blue Angel, and just a great stick. And Nasty Manazer was another one um, that you you would uh, you know kind of emulate your your uh, uh, your flying after. And they would they would be there describing okay you know how to how to position the, the Tomcat, uh, and the Tomcat I would say is um, is a very easy airplane to fly. I mean it was designed and I think it was a very easy airplane to fly. Now I see your face crunch. It was a very <laughs> it was a very very hard airplane to fly well. Uh, that okay I'll I'll buy that's that. the key. Uh, that's and so you true. had a lot of average people out there. Who could you know maneuver the airplane and it was basically you know safe because the, I mean you had these big long wings and it was a safe airplane for just basic maneuvering, but to fly it well was very difficult and uh, and you only I mean and you you could name you know very quickly those outstanding Tomcat pilots, Snort Snodgrass, God rest his soul, who just passed away uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, like I say, you've got Nasty Manazer who could fly a great airplane. You had Killer Killian who could fly it around the boat like nobody's business. And, um, uh, and Pogo and, and a few of these other people. Um, so, there, so it was very distinctive who could fly the airplane well and then everybody else. And so you kind of, you, you learn very quickly who, who you wanted to kind of listen to and, and uh, model yourself after. Um, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't teach you tricks. It was really, you, would, you had to learn the basics. You had to learn energy management. You had to learn, you know, the, 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 um, where the Tomcat had the advantage and where the Tomcat had a disadvantage and where you wanted to stay away from. So um, the, the, in, in the early days, in fact, for most of my career, even my command tour, I was flying the F-14A. And they were notoriously uh, underpowered engines, and they were designed that way because it was a mix between uh, high speed and afterburner, and then loitering. So you can have a long, you know, long endurance for these these air uh, superiority uh, missions that you fly. And so the there were times that that it didn't matter if you got slow, but it was always when you were on the top. And if you got on the top, you could sell it all, and it had hellacious pitch rate. And you would you use that to your advantage, and then there were times that if you got slow at the bottom, you were going to have your hands full. So you learned what where to stay away from it, and uh, and where to maximize your advantage and minimize your disadvantage. And so it, those were the things that I remember and I focused on. And it wasn't so much, boy, if you just do you know pull the stick this way and do rudder that way, it'll be automatically and you win. It never happens yeah. that way. Yeah. And so. I will tell you, some of the students that thought, boy, if I only knew how to, if I could only do this one maneuver, I would win. And you missed the whole package because that was just one move. But you're fighting a series of moves and series of counter moves. And if you're not, if you're not understanding what's happening, then you're just going to be, you know, it, you're going to fail and you're going to wonder why. Boy, I did that maneuver, but I didn't survive. Yeah, Slammer, I tell you, it's uh, you're 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 bringing me back uh, a little while because I remember back when I was a young Jo, um, and I was trying to figure all that stuff out, and and you just didn't get enough, you did, you never felt like you got enough time flying the airplane to really understand it. Every time you'd go, be like, hey, I got a one v one today, and that's awesome, or I got some uh, air combat maneuvering time, I get to go up and fight it, but then. I don't get to fly for another three days. And, and I would always sit there and I'd be reading in the, the Top Gun manual and trying to learn these tricks. And I'd go talk to some of the guys who'd been around for a little bit. And, uh, you know, sometimes we we just sit around and trade notes, you know, and talk to other guys. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know. I found I found that I would 
I d- didn't realize how little I knew about flying that airplane until I was already at Top Gun. Right. And then by the after three years at Top Gun, I left and I was like, wow, you know, man, I, there is so much so much that I've learned that I don't know. And, uh, you know, meaning that there was still so much more to learn. And I, I know that me personally, like you talk about the airplane being easy to fly but hard to fly well. I can think back to being on deployment as a department head and just going out and going, you know what, I'm going to try this thing that – so-and-so told me about one time and you sit there and you go wow that actually that actually worked and i can i can add that to my game because as you said like if you're in a, if you're in a fight and you just think about this one turn you know hey i hit the merge i hit the one turn I, yeah i i don't know about you but i'm probably going to lose pretty quickly in the next two or three because I'm, I'm gonna bet if i hit if slammer and i are hitting the merge together and i'm just thinking about this one he's you're thinking three moves ahead right right and and so yeah, exactly. And if you're not thinking three moves ahead, and that takes a long time. I don't know. I was yeah. I was probably well into my time at Top Gun before I was effectively thinking three moves right. ahead, you yeah. know. And it was interesting. I mean, later on, I ended up being the uh, the skipper of the F-14 RAG. And, um, and so all the RAG instructors were all the top of their squadrons. You didn't get a RAG instructor who wasn't number one or number two. And, uh, and it was funny. So even there... I would fly 1v1s, and, uh, and I remember the, the F-14 D-babies. And Crunch, I know you were a D-baby. Uh, no, no. Oh, no. I, no, no, okay. no. I flew the D in the end. I started off as F-14As. I have like 1,000 hours in the A. Half my All time's right. in the A. Almost. Yeah. Well, I was flying against D-babies. And so, like you're talking about, you know, students that would rely on the one move. Well, D-babies would ro- rely on their motors. They had the GE motors mm-hmm. that were fabulous uh very high powered but they thought that's all you needed was this thrust and i remember i would i would actively seek out flying the f-14a against those guys and d's and i would destroy them because they didn't understand basic fighter maneuvers they thought that all they needed to do is you know use these big motors and and I hate to say it, this one time, I, I it was a 1v1, just instructor versus uh, myself. I'm in the A, and we do two dogfights, and it ends horribly for him both times. Uh, because the same thing. He just thinks all you got to do is is put those big motors on and make a big loop. And you're, I'm sitting there in an A going, all I need to do is get inside his loop. And I'm shooting him. And, and, and the, it didn't register um, to the last Last engagement, I told my Rio, who was an instructor Rio, I go, I'm going to fly the F-14A in mill, and I'm going to beat him. And here it is, an F-14A in mill against an F-14D rag instructor, and he made a fateful error, you know, nose low at the merge, where that's perfect for me, and he's got a big turn, I've got a small turn, and now I'm shooting him again. So, wow. That was the, the people who relied on either a trick or their motors and didn't understand the basics of basic fighter maneuvering were the ones that didn't do very well. And that's what Top Gun taught you. That's what right. Top Gun you know, was all about. I hope that a lot of real aviation fans and Tomcat fans, and especially the DCS, the flight simulator players, I hope they watched you know, the last 10 minutes of what you guys have been saying. Because you're just talking about the necessity to really be a master instead of a trickster, you know, or, right. you know, to, to boil it down. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, Slammer, do you have any uh, good stories about going through Top Gun class as a student? Uh, what year did you go through the class, uh, and and did that help help your uh, your Tomcat pilot skills? Oh, absolutely, With, without a question. This was in the old days when there was, I think, it was an eight week class. Um, now what they're wow. doing now, which is a three-month class or something, and, and, and the training is much better now, I think, than it was um, back when I went through. But they, it, the class I went through, and, and shoot, I got to think it might have been in like 1989. Um, huh. Okay. Cato Cook. It was four Tom. It was uh, four Tomcats and four Hornets, and the four Tomcats. <laughs> well, that had to be awesome. Yeah. yeah it was a class of eight. And uh, Art Deco, Starrett, and I were in, in the Artvark Bird. Uh, she Boy White Cell, who is now Air Pack, uh, was a Rio and a RAG instructor. 
in with, um, oh shoot, I forget his name, um, two East Coast guy, uh, squadrons, two West Coast squadrons, and then the, the four Hornet squadrons, two of them were, were Marines, and Cato uh, Cook was one of them. So out of that class, we ended up with Cato Cook being a Top Gun instructor, me being a Top Gun uh, instructor, um, um, one guy being an air wing commander, one guy being air pack. So it was a, it was a good, grump, good group of folks there. Um, but going through, going through the course back at that time, you always started with 1v1s. And, and, uh, and it, it really made a lot of sense. The, the Navy spends an awful lot, at least it d did at that time, a lot of time and energy on 1v1 skills. And if it's the foundation for everything else that goes on, and and at any given time in, in a in a multi-ship dogfight, you will find yourself one v one against something, and so it really honed those skills that you had to be able to defend against that other aircraft, uh, fight it to the best of your ability, to allow your wingmen to come in and maybe uh, uh, be in an offensive position and shoot them, or even if you were in a last-ditch missile D, where you're getting shot from a surface-to-air missile, and you do your hardest 1v1 maneuvering around that missile. It's the same skills and the same physics and aerodynamics that all apply. So they spent a lot of time focused on the 1v1 aspect of it. And that's where you, you did learn how to fly that airplane um, and, and, uh, and really fight it to the best of its abilities. And so you always avoided getting in those positions that you knew you couldn't recover from. You maximized the advantages in those areas that, that you knew you had a, a, uh, um, uh, an advantage over another aircraft and, um, and really honed those skills. So they started with that, and then you'd move into section tactics um, and now start to you know, go into more um, mission-oriented operations and activities. And so you start with section tactics where two of you are operating together and then you go into a four ship, and then you go into strikes where you're, you're performing different missions, whether it be MIG sweep, uh, have a cap, all the different missions that a, that a fighter would, would uh, uh, you know, basically be assigned. And you would learn each one and how to maximize the, the overall capability of the package that you were uh, involved with. And back at that time, they would, they would um, uh, basically craft the mission around different threat scenarios. And so not only were you, you operating and learning the basics of just tactical employment of your airplane, but also if you were in a, 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 a Korean scenario, what would the Koreans be doing based on their, their fighter tactics so that you, could, you would train to them, you would, uh, you would go out and fight against them, see what they look like on radar, learn how they popped up from behind the hills, and you would have been exposed to that type of threat, a Soviet threat, all of the different threats. And so you'd work your way through to not only flying your own airplane to the best of its ability, but also being introduced to all of the different combat scenarios that you might find yourself in. And so you would, you would be introduced to that, you would react to that, you would, you would build in that, that, um, that experience base that now you could you wouldn't be seeing it for the very first time if you found yourself out there, and that's how Top Gun was was structured at that time. And then for us, we would go back as as um, you know Top Gun trained uh, lieutenants back into our squadrons, and then we would teach those tactics, you know, or those basic fighter maneuvers or those threat tactics to the squadron. And that was the, the idea at the time. That's awesome. So, yeah, so for the, for the listeners, it's interesting. You just uh, touched on a thing. So uh, Top Gun back then to Top Gun now, this is probably, what, 1989, 1990? Is that I, so I went through as a student in 89. I was an instructor from 90 to 93. Gotcha. Okay, so, and, so what would happen is back then, uh, you know, you're in the fleet squadron. You go to Top Gun. You go back to your fleet squadron, and then... <laughs> After that, you would then go on to be a Top Gun instructor. So you would just be like, hey, I'm an accomplished fleet pilot. I have been through Top Gun as a student, and now I show up as a squadron uh, or as a Top Gun instructor as my short first short tour. 
when I was there, it was different. So this fast forward about 10 years, and it has now moved. It's no longer in Miramar. It's now in Fallon, Nevada. And the course is longer, and it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit different. There's more strike stuff, um, still similar setup. But then you don't show up. You don't do it as a JO, or I'm sorry, you don't do it as part of your fleet, your first fleet squadron. You finish your first uh, uh, fleet tour as a, as a lieutenant, and then your first squadron tour, you know, they say, or first, golly, I'm all over the place. Your first short tour, you go to Top Gun, and you just say, hey, I am now a Top Gun instructor. But you got to go through the class graduate do well enough to stay and then keep going um which is actually it, it's kind of crazy if you think about it but it has worked but it is a little bit different now than it was back then yeah. now i know that when so i was went through, I looked, so I'll, I'll jump in on you crunch real quick yeah the, uh, um it was really interesting because the model was based on the on the um um the vietnam you know experience and for Vietnam, they wanted to give people an opportunity to get, you know, have that, that combat experience, that simulated combat experience before they went back to Vietnam and, and they wouldn't make the same mistakes um, that they did then. But as, as I found out, though, is students going through Top Gun didn't automatically go back to their squadron and become the training officer. In some squadrons, the CO put them in a different position where they couldn't really you know, influence the rest of the squadron. And there was something weird there that that we saw as a, a fundamental failure. And and you would see it now you now I'm an instructor at Top Gun and you would see the students from all of the different squadrons come through and you would see some that were like via fifty one students were always good because they had a tactical focus and they were well trained. Other squadrons were just horrible. The students would come through and just, they couldn't do the basics. And so it really, it was really hit or miss based on how the squadron CO used the Top Gun um, experience that his JOs had. And we found that as a fundamental flaw, which led to where you were, Crunch, you know, fast forward four or five years yeah. later, because it was at the right. end of my tour in 93 that we started to shift it to the Swifty program. Oh, okay. And we, we were fundamentally changing things because we saw the flaws that the current si uh, situation had. And you would have a person coming through with 500 hours and not really have the experience that you needed when you really wanted to get a guy with about, or a gal with a thousand hours because you're so much more on the, on the step and they could be much more influential once they got back into their training officer positions. And so that transition happened right at the end of our my tour and, and led to what I think is an absolutely um, much better training uh, situation in, in Naval Air. Well, I, I agree with you, Slammer. I got to give Navy Air credit for making those changes that you guys have just described. I mean, it, it is a, uh, it's nice to see them realize we can improve this and then make the changes uh, and do it. Crunch. Yeah, well, I was just going to say there's a whole bunch of things like I'm, I'm bookmarking in my head as you talk through there because there's so many different <laughs> things we could talk about in there. You talked about the 500 hour pilot coming through. I got something on that. Uh, we talked about changing to the SFTI program, which for the listeners, the Strike Fighter Tactics Instructor, and that's the new syllabus program. Um, and you also talk about um, the support for Top Gun. And what I think the listeners, we, I don't know if we want to go there, but let's talk about it. If, if we can always change it. But uh, the listeners may be surprised to know that, I mean, there are people who, I, let's call them Top Gun haters, right? There are, oh, yeah. I don't know why, but if you might have one of those COs that just doesn't feel that it's valued, they don't care for it. There are plenty of people I've met that they just don't have a respect for it for whatever reason. I don't know. What's your no, experience? Is, is that's that new absolutely to true. That's okay. absolutely true. And you would see that. Um, and you would know that by what they did with the student that came through the course and how they were utilized. Um, and, and there were, there were squadrons and I hate to say it, Top Gun was at Miramar was on the West coast. There were a lot of East coast squadrons that, that were not, did not buy into the program. And even when we got into the SFWTI program, the Swifty program, there were some East coast squadrons that once again, did not buy into it. In fact, so I'll, I'll jump ahead. I had the great fortune, of after leaving Top Gun, 
right when they were right when we were pushing Air Pack to change the syllabus, that two years later, after I went to my department head tour, I came back to be the the director of the Tomcat Strike Fighter Weapons School, mm-hmm. with the very first Swifty students, and I remember Chaser Keithley, um, Grumpy Kimberly, uh, Ob O'Brien, Opie Taylor were the very first Swifty Tomcat guys, and I took them. All over the West Coast, they were believers in Miramar, and I took them on the East Coast to all the different squadrons. And thank God, the weapons school uh, skipper at the time, who was an A6BN, I believe, and even Long Aquilino was there at the time, they, they uh, embraced us and allowed us to go to the different squadrons. And some squadrons didn't want to deal with us, and others welcomed us in. Um, and that really was the, the beginning of the Swifty program within the Tomcat community. So I was really fortunate timing wise to be involved with both. So I, I want to make uh, one clarification, and this is also, you know, for the audience. And that is to say that not all good Tomcat pilots went through Top Gun. I mean, there were some guys that did not go through Top Gun and yet they were still excellent, outstanding yep. Tomcat pilots. Yep. But Top Gun was very good training, and, and the comments at Crunch and Slammer made. And, but another thing on a positive is the Swifty program. I mean, I was away from uh, Tomcats for a few years, and when I came back, that program had been implemented. And I was just amazed and impressed at how uh, it, it raised the uh, level of uh, you know, lethality and effectiveness of, of the average junior officer. So, so Bio, I, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that – Maybe, maybe known, maybe not known. Remember okay, what I said good. about the skipper? Yeah. In our staff exes, and Crunch, you remember, and, and Bayou, you do remember that as well. In our Top Gun staff exes, one of the reasons we designed it the way we did was to take the skipper out of the equation. This was a course that was a criteria level one, two, three, four, and the skipper did not have the choice or the ability to change it. Man, that's very interesting. That's, that's good. I mean, it worked, but. Yeah, and so so you either had skippers that embraced it or didn't, but the fact is you had air pack that, that rolled this thing out. This was the training curriculum. And that yeah. what we did by that was we raised the floor of all squadrons. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it was it was sure did. wildly successful. It, and, and just for the listeners, so that uh, you know, to to share with them what we're talking about. So the Strike Fighter Tactics Instructor Program (SFTI) uh, was a graduate of Top Gun in the new syllabus, and they came back to the fleet or to the weapons. So wait a minute, that's the person was the graduate. Exactly, exactly. That's so the, the SFTI, and they they administered basically the SFWT program, the Strike Fighter Wap. Wep- Weapons and tactics. Weapons and tactics. Weapons and tactics. Thank you. Uh, syllabus, and you had four, four levels in your combat wingman, and I think there were like somewhere around fifteen flights, and they were standardized. Flights one, you would do this. Two, you do this. You had learning objectives uh, on each flight. You had uh, a level two, which was a combat wingman. Level, no, I'm sorry. Level one was a rag student. Level two was a combat wingman. Level three was a combat section lead. And level four was a combat division lead, meaning four airplanes. And it was standardized throughout the fleet. And in the beginning, I know when I was there, this was 96 when it was rolling out that I was learning to be going through the level two program. And, uh, you know, some squadrons you could see were really embracing it. And it was really good. And then I remember it was a struggle to get my level three check ride. And my squadron, we tied it and said, you want to be a a section lead? you have to pass your level three check ride. Yep. And it was very difficult to get it scheduled between the assets, the adversaries, the ranges, the the instructor from the weapon school. I think you were there at the time. Um, it was difficult to arrange all these assets. And oh, by the way, I need two good radars and two good airplanes and right. everything else. And next thing you know, you're like, you get one shot at this once a month to pass this check ride. And I remember it was a real challenge, but wow, did I learn a lot. I was the product. <laughs> of this system that you put together and oh my god was it amazing i personally learned so much it made me such a better pilot absolutely yeah no and it was it was the shared wisdom of a bunch of lieutenants that said we've got to make this better and and where it really kind of stood out to us is we would have both navy students and also marine corps students 
Well, the Marine Corps would not send people with less than that weren't already WTI called and about a thousand hours in the airplane. The Navy would send people there. I think the minimum was 500 and you could wave it down to 300 hours in type. And the disparity between that, between the capability and just the, the, you know, the head work and the air, air sense of somebody with a thousand hours versus 500 was stark. And so that was by sitting there and observing that, we said, we have to get better. We're wasting our time with, with people who just aren't capable of really pulling everything they need out of the syllabus. And, and that's why you wouldn't go into the SFWTI program until the end of your first tour. And then you would, the, uh, or complete it, and then, and then be considered for an instructor position. I guess I ought to clarify that. Uh, and then you would go back as an instructor much more experienced and have this very, very well standardized training curriculum uh, to make you much more effective in the range of tactics and missions that you'd, you would be flying in a Tomcat. It was really a, a, a tremendous program. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. So it's funny. This is not the direction that I think Bio and I had intended this conversation to go. We were we were like, hey, we're going to talk about stick and rudder and flying the airplane. And holy cow! This has been a great conversation about the uh, the the birth of basically the the modern Top Gun program. It's absolutely amazing. So I, in that note, uh, so when you were there, you know, before you as you're developing this new system, what was your SME area, your subject matter expert area? What was yours? So I was a, the section uh, tactics guy for the ah. Tomcat. So there were there were two key t key um, um, uh, curriculums, the one v one SME and then the section lead SME. At my time, it has evolved into mission planning, and there's some other things that are uh, much more, uh, uh, I guess, probably much more important now. But at the time, <clears throat> those were the two key um, uh, courses. And Trim Downing was the one v one guy, and I was the section guy. Um, so, and I, I wanted it that way because I loved 1v1, you know, but from a combat perspective, section tactics was, was the basic formation and the basic, um, mission portion. And I really was focused on, you know, the execution as a, as a, a larger sense rather than the, the 1v1 skills, um, which I love to fly and I love to, I love 1v1 more than anything, but I thought from a mission employment perspective section was a more influential and had bigger impact on squadron operations. So luckily I got that. So, so just for all the listeners, section is, you know, two airplanes. So we're employing two against an unknown number, 2v2 or 2v7, could be anything like that. And so what you're talking about, not only maneuvering as a, maneuvering the airplane through the sky, but how you actually target the groups, how you employ the radar, how you shoot the missiles, and basically the ranges you're shooting, your timeline, all of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it had to be integrated with the intercepts lecture. I don't know if they still had intercepts, but I oh, sure. think combat section tactics might have picked up where the intercepts finished or some, maybe. maybe. Right, so the... the that was the F-14 intercepts me. Right. And so for the Rios, they had that course. Mm. No, we had, oh, I had, I had pilots in Rios and, and it was very important to me as a Rio instructor to, and I mean, of course I, my murder boards were, uh, were demanding, but I, it was not a combat F-14 intercepts was not a Rio course. It mm. was for pilots and Rios, you know, anyway, Yeah. but I think section, but crunch, some of the things that you're saying were, would have been covered in intercepts. Ah, gotcha. But, it, but the course has evolved also. I mean, right. mm -hmm. you know, they may not have even had intercepts by the time Slammer came along. So um, Top Gun keeps uh, evolving. <laughs> it does. It does. Well, and I, I think the evolution is good. So Slammer, you, one of the things you said, you talked about uh, uh, combat section tactics probably went away. And, and my summary was that in the early years of Top Gun, they seemed to do more about the mechanics. And then as the squadron evolved, you know, uh, you guys have said that 1v1 is essential anytime you're in combat or one, you know, you know, but the Top Gun class emphasizes more mission employment, uh, you know, to be very broad. Right. 
while it still insists on excellent 1v1 maneuvering, you know, talent. So, so the great thing with, and, and they've, they've really hammered that part uh, in the course because you would start you would start 1v1s week one. And by the end of that week one, you were pretty good. And then for the next four or five weeks, you would go through all the different mission elements against all the different threats. And then the, at the very end of the course, and you hadn't been flying a whole lot of 1v1s. You were doing slashing attacks, keeping it fast, you know, shooting, defending, driving in, getting the, the strikers on target. Um, and then at the very end of that, you'd have your graduation 1v1. So you had not been thinking about it at, for a number of weeks. And the grad 1v1 was probably the greatest uh, event ever designed ever designed so pretend purpose. i don't know anything about the grad 1v1 how tell tell our listeners about it many of them might be like oh my god that sounds awesome i never heard of it so the grad 1v1 like i say it, it was it was many weeks after you had finished your 1v1 curriculum and and hadn't really had an opportunity very often to fight a, a very long engaged 1v1 and so we, the whole student population and the instructor population would all get into a single briefing room and everybody would be handed an envelope and no one knew who they were going to fight, what type of aircraft they were going to fight or anything about it and you had rules that you couldn't cheat. For the Tomcat we had a long range uh, television camera system and if they caught you turning that on so you would see what you're going to fight before you hit the merge you know they'd, they'd uh, You'd be branded a branded a pussy. Sorry for the audience, <laughs> but they would Accurate. they would brand you. <laughs> and the idea it was that you would end up on a a, uh, a point in space with a frequency, and you would call and you had a goon call sign. So I was goon twenty four, and you knew you were going against goon thirty three. And we had a frequency, but you didn't know if the goon was an instructor. If it was another student, if it was an F-18, if it was an F-16, an F-15, you didn't know what airplane that person had because you would have guest players that would be invited in as well. And so you'd have this mass brief, you'd walk out, and you'd have a, a show time, a latitude, a longitude, and an altitude, and a frequency, and a goon call sign. And that's how you started it. And you would do your intercept that you were talking about, Bio, and all of a sudden you would you would see what you were fighting and in that split second determine what type of fight you needed to fight against that type of airplane and it was you you know your you it was fat okay so what was yours who'd you fight uh do you you know it's funny i don't remember who i fought as an instructor well because i fought so yeah, many do you remember who what kind of airplane you had? I mean, I had, we had an F five E as our opponent uh, for my grad one v one. Yeah, I think I think I was a as a student. I think I ended up with an F sixteen, an instructor in an F sixteen, and I was a student in an F fourteen. Um, the uh, and I know I know, it, but anyway, it was and so you 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 see what type of airplane this is. For an F sixteen, you know it's got a high G rate, a high turn rate, great thrust to weight. And so you had to do, you know, everything you could to intimidate with the nose, get inside, get as, as, a, uh, as high a pressure fight as you can against that airplane, just to minimize the strengths that it had. And, and you would have to very quickly formulate that because you're hitting the merge at about 1,000 miles per hour uh, combined. 1,000, maybe yeah. 1,200 miles per hour combined. And it, the, cl the time was clicking down, and so you had to... Hit the merge, decide real quickly how you wanted to fight it, and then just everything you had, go after it, and uh, and it was a blast. It was so much fun. Yeah, I remember my when I went through as a student. I remember I hit the merge, and uh, it was a Strike Eagle that was at the merge from when I was a student. And I remember I found out afterwards. Uh, I was like, oh wow, they, uh, you know, I, I did okay. We'll say. And uh, I remember finding out afterwards, I'm like, yeah, they, uh, they actually were weapons school instructors from Nellis. And I was like, oh, oh right. Yeah. They, uh, 
they must not do much they weren't good. air to air down with the strike eagle. Right. <laughs> like, but uh, but then way to go crunch. Well, yeah, and then I know another time where I hit the merge. I was an instructor. I felt pretty good with myself, and uh, I was in an F14A, and I hit the merge with roscoe ross is in the other side and he's in a slick f-18e brand new and of course yep. roscoe was the skipper of the lids at the time and of course yep. i'm sure he told his hey slick that thing off i don't want to win so you know, so i hit the merge and i'll just say "Ooh, yeah, yeah. well roscoe, roscoe's pretty good <laughs> roscoe was in my uh, student class as well i forgot yeah Yep. Yeah. Well, he, Amazing. I yeah. known him a long time, but I remember I hit the merch. I was like, oh, crap, it's Roscoe, and he's in a Super Hornet. <laughs> <laughs> I got my work cut out for me today. It didn't go well. <laughs> Not for me. Okay, uh, I'm going to do our listeners a favor, and I'm going to drag Slammer back to the main topic, and that is do some bragging on the F-14 in terms of what were some of the good things you liked about it in the engaged environment. I mean, we know it was designed. It had to have good, you know, uh, uh, maneuverability. Uh, so, you know, years later when you're flying it. So I'll, I'll narrow it down just to the 1v1 arena. Um, okay. Because yeah. we could spend all day on the, on the way it was designed against the threat it was designed for. It was designed around the, the AUG-9 and the AIM-54 Phoenix weapon system. No, talk Long about range. the fighter pilot. Fighter pilot engaged. Yeah. Right. Um, the, um, uh, like I said, the, the, I, I, I fought in the A, the B, the D, and I fought against A, Bs, and Ds. The best pilots that, that the Tomcat produced, in my, in my view, were all F-14A drivers um, because they, they had to maneuver their airplane uh, much more effectively if there were going to be any good at all, because you were really making up for that, that uh, energy deficiency that you had with the TF-30 engines. Um, and they were, it basically forced you to fight slow. And, and the Tomcat actually was a pretty good slow flying airplane. Uh, I only used the flaps one time in my career and there was a specific reason I did that. Um, but there were many people who really sang the praises of the flaps. And when you fought slow with full flaps, it was a, incredibly impressive airplane um, but I'll tell you the when you were on the receiving and I was in an F-16 uh, and you're looking at the nose of a Tomcat coming at you in close proximity it is very very intimidating and so you would you would want to keep the fight as tight as you could uh, hopefully get the the uh, if your adversary was an F-16 or something else like keep his nose low so that he wasn't going to try and extend the fight and, and uh, use his, his uh, power to his advantage. But as long as you could keep that nose pointing at him, you, could come, you, you would drive his behavior. And so my whole point when, when I was flying and when I was instructing back in the squadron and as a CO, it was you have to, you got you to gotta be pointing at the enemy and you got to, it, you have to, whether it be long range weapons employment or in the short uh, range environment, you had to get the nose on and you had to keep the nose on. And that would by itself drive behaviors that may not be in the best entrance of the, uh, of the uh, airplane you're flying against. So you, in an F-14A, they never taught rudders. I use rudders like a wild man um, because the roll rate was not all that, all that fast. As I mentioned earlier, the pitch rate was hellacious. If your nose was low, you had these two uh, horizontal stabilizers that were as big as the A4 wings. And you, you could basically bury the stick and that nose would fly through the air. Uh, now you needed to be nose low to really be able to, because you sold a lot of energy to do so, but you could get a nose pointing on a uh, adversary and then make him do something dumb. And um, in the same way, in the in the roll, uh, uh, with the roll rate, is just using the ailerons by itself. In fact, actually, we didn't have really ailerons. You had spoilers and and diagonal or horizontal stabs that would deflect, and so it wasn't a very uh, efficient from an aerodynamic standpoint um, way to roll. But if you used a lot of rudder with that, that nose would would kick around, 
and you never really not everybody learned that. So if you were if you were flying slow, those were the things you had to do to be able to position and roll inside another aircraft at a at a very effective rate. Um, and those were the those were the skills that that you know that not everybody learned. And as I said earlier, when you did it right, it was magic. And it was a it was you would come back from that that fight, you know, saying that was a good one. I fought it to the limits of that airplane and the capabilities that it provided. One more thing, you, the TF-30s you thought were adequate. I mean, you, you're not sitting here bitching about them over and over again. Obviously, everybody wants more thrust in a fighter. But, Slammer, you you made it work with the TF-30s, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, now the TF-30 was, the, those weren't good engines. You had to fly the engines as well as as, as much as you flew the airplane. And yeah. there were many times that, that the engines bit me because uh, they were really stall prone in certain situations. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course, yeah. So if you avoided those positions and avoided, you know, some problems with the engine, you could get it to work to your advantage. And, um, and as I said earlier, of all the A, Bs, and Ds that I flew, if I was going to fight the airplane, I liked the A. I just, because you could do more with it. And um, uh, and I'll tell you a, a quick story. So the uh, um, on uh, on the Kosovo combat cruise, we had a line period that uh, we were able to finish the line period, and the ship went up to um, someplace in France. But they sent two Tomcats and two Hornets to Sardinia um, to an air base called Decimamanu Air Base. And the, uh, the uh, German Air Force was there, and we were able to spend five days fighting with the German Air Force. And they had MiG-29s and they had F-4s. And, and it was funny, and I've seen this in, through the years, is all of Europe are really impressed with the Tomcat. They, I think they just, the French, the Brits, the Germans, they just, they all love the Tomcat for whatever particular reason. I mean, it, it's a cool airplane, um, not as maneuverable as a MiG-29, not as maneuverable as a Hornet, but it had kind of a cachet to it, like, a, I mean, that, that they all sort of liked. Yeah. And uh, this one day I was, I was fighting a MiG-29, and the, um, um, and the fellow who was, uh, was driving it was the MiG-29 demo pilot for the, the German Air Force. A funny guy, really funny guy, but a good stick. And, uh, and so we have this 1v1, and, and uh, we started off what, which, what we would call a butterfly start. And so we'd be at 18,000 feet, 350 knots, and basically what it did was is set you up at a known energy level. And then you would turn away to get about three and a half miles, and then you would turn back in so you'd have a neutral merge. But the difference was you didn't know the energy state of the other aircraft. You were co-altitude, but the energy state was different. And so once again, depending on how you wanted to fight that type of fight, um, you had to react to uh, the, the opponent's energy state just as much as the airplane. The first fight, I'll never forget, did not work out well for me. The, uh, I, I tried the aggressive pressure fight, and uh, I failed miserably. I'll just put it that way, I failed miserably. And so as, I'm, as we knock it off, we're flying back in to get into the same position, and I'm scrambling through my mind. What do I, I, you know, I, I, what do I gotta do, what do I gotta do? And I realize, okay, I can't fight the, air, the airplane, I gotta fight the pilot. And so I changed my tactic, and I, what I wanted him to do is commit into a position that would be unfavorable for him. And here you have a MiG-29 that has all the thrust in the world. It is a hellacious beast. And as we came back from the, uh, the butterfly start, I intentionally flew directly under him. And normally you want to fly as close as possible to take out all turning room and all lateral separation. Well, I came in what we would call showing some leg. 
I wanted him to bite. And so I came in below him at about a thousand feet and I knew he was aggressive as hell. And sure enough, he bit. So as he, as he went by me, I looked over my shoulder as I pitched the nose up and I saw his two afterburners. And he is probably doing 500 knots straight downhill with both afterburners. And I was like, gotcha. And so I came up over the top. Yep, you got it, Crunch. And repositioned my nose and am looking at a, a arcing MiG-29. But here's the thing about the MiG-29. When it had fuel in the center line, it was limited to maybe eight Gs. And if the Germans overstressed, it was a really bad thing. That, that airplane would be down for several days. And as I'm coming over the top and he's looking at the nose of a Tomcat, he overstresses and calls, knock it off, knock it off, knock it off. Um, we join up, we come in, and he's gonna do a straight in. Oh. And, <laughs> and all he could talk about was fighting this Tomcat. And he forgot completely how he just destroyed me on the first fight, but the reputation was made at that point. And the Tomcat against the MiG-29 was, the reputation was made. And it wasn't because well of the done. airplane, I got into his head. <laughs> that's awesome. So that's an interesting. What a great story that is. You Wait know, a minute, is that the source of a great HUD photo that, that was circulating on the Internet a few years ago? Did, uh, did you ever see that? Yeah, there I don't know if Tom it was my, there, HUD? there was another, there was another, uh, there were a couple out there. And uh, I know mine was one of them. But uh, there you go. Very impressive to see gun camera with a MIG down yep. below right in the uh, in the reticle we were talking earlier about thinking three moves ahead and i think this is a great example you know for anybody who's not familiar the way you just described that you can hear how you had thought it out ahead of time and you had a plan at the merge that was not just one turn two turn you had a whole game plan going and i'm gonna bet i'm gonna make an assumption that you were coming in low a thousand feet low showing him some leg i bet you were slow too weren't you yes yeah. Yep. So that was something was, that you didn't say, because otherwise, if you were fast, it wouldn't work. Right. Right. Exactly. So there's a there's a there's an airspeed called corner airspeed. And that is where you get the maximum lift without over stressing the aircraft. And I came in probably 30 to 40 knots above that, which meant I had a little bit of, of airspeed to, uh, to bleed off. But I could maximize my my roll or my pitch rate without over stressing the airplane. And so. You were at the at the most maneuverable point of the the, uh, the energy management diagram that, that we would talk about. That's so, awesome. Yeah, so I came in at that at that airspeed, giving him some leg, committing him nose low, and he bit like a big dog. <laughs> and he had to do a straight in, and yep. that night at the bar, you won. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, and even and, and so I'll I'll tell another story along that. I had a German in my back seat. <laughs> and so the uh as we were coming in on this straight and so i'm flying on his wing um the tomcat is a single piloted airplane you have a, a stick in the front seat and you have a, a, a radar hand controller in the back seat which kind of looks like a stick but you can only fly the airplane from the front well as we're coming in it was pretty boring because we it was just straight and level we couldn't do any more maneuvering because he'd overstress his airplane so badly that i told my german i go would you like to fly the airplane and he goes <laughs> oh, not this <laughs> not this yep and uh he goes yeah i i didn't think you could i go well i can i can set it up we got a data link mode that I can give you control and you can do it with your, you can fly the airplane with your hand controller. And I said, I can, I can link us together and then you have to go half action on your trigger, which for me, now I put a little dot on my radar so I could see exactly what he was doing with his hand controller. And so I asked him if he was ready. He said, yeah, yeah. And I said, okay, your airplane. And when he moved the stick to the left, I could see the little, uh, little, uh, cursor move left and I'd roll the airplane left and he'd move up you know pull it back and I'd move the airplane up and so I was mimicking his moves on his hand controller and he's going oh this is great this is great 
and then I'm flying <laughs> in a nice formation. We're doing a little maneuvering, and then I do a canopy roll, just out of the blue. Do this, and I start screaming at him. What are you doing? What are you doing? I got the airplane. <laughs> and he was so panicked, he didn't know what he had done. Uh, and I go, whoa, it's very sensitive. You got to be very careful back there. And uh, the uh, the jer- the MiG twenty nine guy is kind of looking at us as we go over the top of him. And I go, you got to be very sensitive, be very careful. It's a very sensitive uh, control. But uh, would you like to do it again? <laughs> and he said yes. <laughs> and so I did the same thing again. <laughs> At that point, he, he wanted to know more of it. Um, oh, anyway, man. fun things you can do in a Tomcat. Oh my lord, that's hilarious. Well, hey, so that the, great. Uh, this so that's funny. Now, when when you were when you were at Top Gun, did you fly the A force and this F sixteen and and all this stuff too? Yeah. So we had the, we did. had the Tomcat there, F fourteen A's. We had the A four Echo and the A four Super Fox, and then the one and two seat uh, Viper. So we had all oh, three. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. Gotcha. Now uh, the A four Echo single seat A four Super Fox was a two seat, right? Do I have that no. right? No, all the, one seat. The Fox was um, was a single seat, but you had a P408 motor, and it was a beast. So nice. you were you were almost one to one thrust to weight ratio at takeoff, and then very quickly at one to one thrust to weight. It was a it was a, an amazing airplane. Interesting. So okay, so everybody loves to compare and contrast A4 versus the F14, F16 versus the F14. You know, from a pilot's point of view. If if I was in an A4, well, the A4 had uh, the advantages it had was in the slow uh, slow speed arena because you had these aerodynamic slats that would drop down when you were below probably 250 to 260 knots indicated. And then you'd also put the flaps down to maybe a third flaps and you could get into this. You could get into a, a turning fight, and you would you would turn inside your own tail. It was it was such a tight fight. So, if you're if you are going against an F-16 who's doing 450 knots and pulling nine Gs, he's making this big arc through the sky, but at nine Gs, you could be turning inside of him at two and a half Gs and maintaining position the whole time. So. You couldn't get away with it fighting Top Gun and uh, F-16 guys, but if you're fighting Air Force F-16 guys, they didn't really understand that, and so you could really do some good work with against them because they they were taught you fight at a certain you know speed to maximize the 9G, which gives you a great turn rate, but turn rate's not going to help you when you're fighting a one circle fight and somebody's inside your turn circle. So that's what the A4 could do. It could get inside the turn circle. Uh, with the Tomcat, the, uh, the, the, the Tomcat would, would use separation to its advantage, uh, unless you're going against the Fox, and then, then you had a little bit harder fight. Um, but if you were, if you, the, the A4 would want to draw you in as close as it could. Um, or if, they, if it was fighting multi-ship, get out far enough that you lose sight of it. And then it would sneak in, and once you lost sight of it, you know, it was going to be a, a rough day for you. So they, they would either keep you in as tight as you could or get out of range, and uh, you'd lose them in the, in, the, uh, in the sun or against the, the backdrop, and then they'd be able to, you know, come in at an advantage angle. F-16, you could do pretty much whatever you wanted. The thing had so much thrust to weight. It had such great uh, handling characteristics that a well-flown F-16, you really, really had your work cut out for you if you were going against that guy. So you could, you could do, you know, take advantage of your rate uh, advantage. Uh, you could do a vertical fight uh, because you're, you know, basically one-to-one thrust to weight. Um, it really, you could pretty much use whatever fight you wanted. And the Tomcat, you'd have to figure out, okay, how am I going to, uh, once I said earlier, is how do I keep pointing at him to make him react into a, so he's not getting the most, you know, advantage out of the, the capabilities that airframe gives him. Um, so each one you fought differently. Uh, each one, if you fought it well, you came back with a great sense of satisfaction. Um, and each one, I loved flying each of them 
for the characteristics and the capabilities they each offered. And I'd fight each one of them very differently. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Good summary, Slammer. Uh, you know, it makes me wish we could go out and uh, man up some jets and, and oh, yeah. uh, take this in the air, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, because two of those jets you're talking about were two-seaters, so I could enjoy the fight and, you know. Right. Um, okay. I'm thinking of uh, something else, though. Maybe, maybe I think a little bit too much about social media and stuff, but I, I, uh, I see things on, on uh, enthusiast sites all the time. One of the Tomcats features that has a lot of, uh, of interest is the glove veins. Mm -hmm. Slammer. I think everybody watching this, pro I'm looking for my Tomcat model. I'll, I'll get a picture, but I think everybody knows what glove veins are. Slammer, do you have any thoughts on the glove veins? Well, I guess you go back to the design of the air aircraft and what it was designed for. It was multi-mission at the design phase. So it was both an air-to-air -air superiority fighter, but also had an air-to-ground capability. And that capability was not used for the vast majority of my time in the Tomcat. Um, but if I remember right, the glove veins, which were um, triangular looking uh, flat surfaces that would come out of, here's my Tomcat. Oh, nice. They would come out right here and they would form kind of a, a little, little uh, triangle off there. And the idea was as I, under, as I remember it, was in the air-to-ground attack phase, you had these glove veins to make, there we are, to make your airplane that much more stable in an air-to-ground environment. Um, they, since we weren't fighting in it, you know, using the aircraft in the air-to-ground uh, arena at that time, you, you really didn't, they never did much for you. Um, sometimes you'd come in the break, you'd pull them out just because you thought it looked cooler, uh, but that's yeah, about the yeah. only thing. And finally, they, they uh, basically secured them in and electrically disconnected them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, glove veins addressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember when, I, uh, you know, in, in the end, you know, the, the circuit breaker was pulled and there was a zip tie, collar tie on it. Right. Supposedly completely disconnected. No way could they could work. And then every once in a while, all of a sudden, like you'd be turning in it, you know, doing a, uh, you know, just running up the hydraulics before starting the glove veins to move out. And you're like, how did <laughs> thought, really? I thought they were disconnected. <laughs> all right. right. That that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> right. All right. Something's wrong here. We got to fix that. But um yeah, for those who don't know, like there was a way to do it. Like you could put the if you put the wings back, so you on the left throttle, you you, you take the wings, you electrically sweep them back all the way to sixty eight, and then you had the the DLC maneuvering flap thumb wheel, and you pull that pull that uh, back, I guess it was, and the glove veins would come out. It was kind of it was kind well. Of cool. The other thing is, if you remember Crunch, and if I'd forgotten until just this moment, but you had a bomb mode. That's right. So you would you would select in bomb mode, and I think that was fifty five degrees of uh, wing yeah. sweep. Mm -hmm. And then the yep. glove veins would come out and the idea was again to give the airplane the most stable platform as it's in a 45 degree dive or whatever. Back then it was all dumb bombs. And it was, I think, intentionally designed to give it as much stability as possible in that air to ground arena. Well, you know, that's a great, great point. So in the it was designed for air to ground and air to air. And for the first 25 years or so it was all air to air about 20 right around 20 20 years okay From so 74 to 90 whatever yeah. 90 whatever so somewhere around 90 90s whatever <laughs> we decided yeah. to get into the bombing and, and and i think all three of us were there at the time uh i was brand new uh you older guys had uh we're, we're you know getting to the end there. no i'm all, i'm kidding in any case uh but you know you had been there for the, from the beginning what's what's your feeling on the airplane you know, actually, now that I say that, you, you then took it into combat in an air-to-ground mode in Kosovo, right? Yep. So what's your feeling on, on the transition from air-to-air -to, -air to almost exclusively air-to-ground in the end? Yeah. Let's talk about well, that. So it, it, um, I'll, I'll step back to my first deployment. Uh, as I said, Don Bringle, Katie Bringle was the OPSO, and he was my flight lead. And when we were out in, in, uh, in the Arabian Gulf, North Arabian Gulf, actually, we never went through the Straits of Hormuz. Um, 
but it was during the tanker wars. Hmm. And while we were there, there was a, a uh, the Iranians had, had um, uh, hit a couple uh, tankers that we were escorting through the Strait of Hormuz. And because of that, there was a thing called Operation Praying Mantis. And we, we were given, I think, a two-day window to sink a number of Iranian ships that were involved with the, uh, with the strikes they had against the, uh, the, uh, the U.S. flagged uh, tankers. And at the time, we were flying escort for the A7s and A6s. Um, but there really wasn't an air-to-air -air threat, so the, the, uh, the only game in town was really the strike capability that the A6 brought with its uh, LGBs and its um, uh, precision weapons and the A7s with their weapons. And so over the course of about a 24-hour period, we had disabled three or four uh, ships and had sunk um, one or two. But it was, it was all a, a strike-centered effort. And at the end of that, Don Bringle, Katie, wrote an article that I think was published in, in the Top Gun magazine uh, about the need for the F-14 to get into the air-to-ground role. And it, he saw it back then, and we all made fun of him because we were all fighter yeah. guys. And, and in Top Gun yeah. at the time, you couldn't say the B word for bombing or you were fined. We were all tough fighter guys. But he saw that back then, that, that you aren't going to be in the game because there was no threat that would come out and, and engage the Tomcat. There was no air-to-air -air threat out there. And so if you weren't in the air-to-ground, you weren't in the fight. And so, you, so he saw that early on, and, and it was really led by the East Coast F-14 community where under Snort Snodgrass and others, they took it to a new level, in, uh, integrated the lantern targeting pod against Navy's wishes and certainly against Navair's wishes. And it was the most brilliant move that could have occurred for the, the, um, the value that the Tomcat brought. Because now you have an airplane with two crew, a lantern targeting pod, which was the same one the F-15 Strike Eagle had, and you had the endurance that the Tomcat naturally brought into the fight. So you, you could have precision targeting capability with a dedicated Rio. His whole purpose in life was managing that lantern targeting pod while yep. the pilot's doing everything else. And we became a very effective strike platform. So much so that when we ended, uh, showed up for Kosovo, Air Wing 8, we had already trained um, a number of crews to be Ford Air Control Airborne qualified, so FAC-8 qualified, and and we the uh, and there was a guy like Brew Brewrud and a couple others that really, you know, through NSOC days and in that period between probably ninety three to ninety six really expanded the capability of the Tomcat in areas that we'd never considered before. And it was done up at NSOC uh, and then on the East Coast. And you started marrying these tactics, tactical employment, um, with this lantern targeting pod. And it was in incredible, the capability that brought. So when we showed up in Kosovo, we had two squadrons, two Tomcat A squadrons, VF-14 top hatters that I was the XO and CO of, and the VF-41 black aces who you had um, Joey Aquin and um, Doug Bowser. Um, and you had two uh, C-model Hornet squadrons. And right off the bat, we were given uh, by the, uh, the CFAC, given the, the um, operating area over Kosovo, while the rest of the U.S. Air Force, with their, with their tactical capabilities and their tactical strike capabilities, focused on the northern side of Serbia. And our... They were looking at good, you know, uh, strategic level targets. We were looking for uh, tanks, artillery, little bitty things hidden behind churches. And, and as they were, as the Serbs were, were uh, you know, annihilating the, the, the uh, Kosovo Albanians, 
the Tomcat was the perfect airplane for that because you had this endurance, you had this fabulous targeting pod, and the F-18s, and it was wonderful. Air Wing 8 was a wonderful air wing, and the F-18 guys knew right off the bat, we'll be bomb trucks, you find the targets, we'll be the bomb trucks. And there was never a competition for resources or who's in charge. They yep. saw that, that they weren't equipped to go after the types of targets we could find and uh, and it really was effective. Between R2, VF14, and 41, they were. We did some fabulous, you know, FAC-A type work. In addition to to major strikes, which we would do in the in the classic Fallon fashion. And one in particular was was really astonishing. That earned a couple of people the Silver Star. But in the in the FAC-A role, it was. You know, we just would plink these, these uh, you know, SA-6s or Zoo 23s or um, tanks that we would find. And, uh, and we had the legs, we had the visibility, and, and between the Tomcat and the A-10s out there, we really had a, 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 um, a, uh, an effective campaign against that type of threat. So the Tomcat really evolved. And over the course of, we had three line, I think either two or three line periods in Kosovo. As a, as a Tomcat squadron, we dropped over 400,000 pounds of ordnance in one squadron. Wow. The sister That's squadron a lot. 400,000 pounds as well. The whole air wing as a total, total uh, was 1.6 million. But think about that from a fighter days, that you're yeah. dropping... 400,000 pounds of ordnance and very effective precision ordnance. This isn't dropping bombs and hoping they hit close. This is you are hitting the specific dimpy that you're, you're aiming at. Uh, and it was really a phenomenal capability, unfortunately way too late in the, uh, the, the Tomcat's life. Uh, but better late than never, and, and boy, it became an a incredible machine. And so this was this was all laser guided bombs because I don't think we were doing JDAM yet, were we? At this point, well, not the F-14 never could. The Bs and the Ds oh. had the capability to uh, to release JDAM, and they were introduced probably around that time. But we did, we were not capable of it. Yeah, I, I remember working with JDAM towards the end. I feel like I was it was at you know, like five six years later though, but I, I could be could wrong. But the point is that this was these were laser guided bombs using the lantern targeting pod on the f-14 where you're using the you're using the the flare system on the lantern to find the target designate it with a laser and some f-18 or yourself are dropping the bomb to hit some tactical target like a tank or an sa-6 or something and basically it's probably a high threat environment if you got sa-6s and zsus right <laughs> yeah no it wasn't I mean, you had you had your prowlers there yeah. um oh okay so, cool oh yeah okay still then, i'm still a little I'm, I'm, I'm ready for game, you know, I'm ready I'd to be go. Nervous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, I've, I've made sure I've got my gun. I, I've probably got my, my evasion chart. I got, I got, I'm ready to go, right? Just yeah. in case. Cool. That's awesome. Okay, Slammer, we are, we're, we have covered a lot of great territory, but, and I'm about to wrap it up, but I want to ask you for one more topic, and that is DFCS, Digital mm -hmm. Flight Control mm -hmm. System. My last Tomcat flight was in 1998, never flew with DFCS. And I talked to a guy who said, bio, it made it a different airplane. What do you think? Can you talk about, uh, did, do you have DFCS? Oh, yeah. You, do you flew? Yeah. I mean, most of your time was n without DFCS, probably. Uh, about half, half of the time. Whatever. Yeah, it, okay. it got introduced about halfway through my flying, uh, flying career. So there were goods and bads, like everything. Um, ah. The bad part of DFCS and the reason it was put in there was to really modulate the rudders. Now, as you know, and many people know, the Tomcat had a, a very, um, um, it, was, it had a propensity to get into a flat spin. And, <laughs> and the DFCS would, would, would drive the flight controls in a manner that that minimized the opportunity for you to get into a flat spin. But okay. by doing right. so, it also took away some of the advantages that, that I described earlier with rudders. 
Ah, and so what okay. it did, DFCS, it blended both rudder inputs with aileron inputs and diagonal tail imp, you know, as you move the, the stick left, diagonal tails, but you'd also had rudder inputs so that you had a, you would, you would fly the airplane in a, uh, in a balanced, um, you, you turn the airplane in a balanced manner. And so it became um, a much, a, a much safer airplane, but it did take away the ability for you to kick in a butt load of rudder to get that nose moving in a, ah, a slow turn. Okay, flight. all right. So it it, uh, be, it made the airplane a much safer airplane, and and it was the right decision to to go that route. Uh, but it did take away some of the the handling ca uh, characteristics if you were trying to you know, maneuver the airplane kind of at the edges of its envelope. Very good. Okay, that's yeah. good perspective. Well, I will, I will say this, though. Um, DFCS in the slow speed environment was amazing. So in, in, the, in the analog flight controls, if you're down there at, let's say, 80 knots or something really slow, you know, oh, you're, you're back and you're dropping, a lot of times you get into this wing rock, right? And you'd have that hard time with the wing rock. With DFCS, you click that on... It'd be steady, even as you're yep. falling out of the sky. It'd be rock solid, yep. and and I'm not saying that I necessarily did this, but somebody told me that if you had a DFCS airplane and turned off the roll sass, that you still could do all that stuff. <laughs> I'm just saying, I might have heard that. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. Do you know we can't try that one? <laughs> okay, I think Crunch. I think uh, you're done. Probably. I mean, yes, I could sir, sit I here for another hour or two, but uh, oh yeah. But we need to, to wrap it up sometime. Slammer, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. You have uh, taken this discussion. Uh, I mean, we, the things that we've covered here, uh, we were just hoping to get some stick and throttle stuff, and we got Sorry. that, <laughs> stick and rudder stuff. No, we got that, but we got a lot more. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your experience and your opinions with us. Uh, you've been a great guest, and it's been our pleasure. Bio Crunch, thanks very much. Enjoyed the uh, time with you. Thanks, Slammer. Really appreciate it. This has been a, a real honor and a pleasure. Thank you. All right. All right. So, hey, that was a great discussion talking about all the aspects of flying the F-14. Um, you know, Bio, one of the things that Slammer brought up that we didn't discuss at the time was JOPA, J-O-P-A. Yeah. Uh, and just for the folks who are, who are listening who aren't, aren't familiar, the JOPA is the Junior Officer Protection Association. Well, it's it's kind of a fun little thing where the 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 O the O threes, the lieutenants and junior, they got almost like a union to stand up to the man, to, uh, you know, the O fours and O fives, the COs and department heads. They're not part of the JOPA. And it's a, it's kind of a fun little thing for, uh, for all the, the lieutenants, but uh, you know, they work together as not, uh, strength in numbers. And the other thing he, he, uh, he brought up was uh, glove veins. And I think you had uh, some th thoughts on that. Thoughts crunch. I've got the Bible. Let's see, here we go. So I've got the uh, F-14 NATOPS manual. This is the oldest one that I have in my collection. It says the glove veins, here's their purpose. They increase aircraft wing area and serve to reduce the excessive longitudinal stability encountered in the supersonic regime. So think about it. They reduce excessive stability. That means they increase maneuverability. Now they're automatically programmed to start out at uh, 1.35 Mach and they reach full extension at 1.45 Mach. So they're effective above 1.35. And as we know, the pilot could use uh, his thumb wheel to thumb them out. So I hope that uh, that fills in your uh, your uh, any knowledge gaps you had about the glove veins so that's it for today i hope you'll join us in two weeks when we're going to talk to a former iranian f-14 tomcat pilot so you don't want to miss that one <laughs>